Wildlife biology is a multidisciplinary <coughs> approach to the study of wild animals and their habitats. Scientists educated in wildlife biology, zoology, and botany perform research and technical investigations. Our next speaker, Fran Maurer, knows all about this. He spent 21 years as a wildlife biologist for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It's my great pleasure to welcome Fran to Greenwich as he made the trip all the way from Alaska. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. When I was growing up on the prairie of western Minnesota, I was fascinated by the stories of the early explorers that went out across our Great Plains. The stories of Lewis and Clark, the stories of the fur trappers, the mountain men who went across the plains to trap beaver and uh, trade in the furs. Uh, the stories of the teeming herds of bison that were there at one time and all the other wildlife that went along with them and the diversity of Native American tribes that lived there. Next, please. And oh, one back. And uh, in the 1830s, one of our great American artists traveled out onto the Great Plains. His name was George Catlin. And after he returned, he made the first recommendation that um, the area, next please, the area from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains should be set aside as he described as a majestic national park. So this area from approximately here out to the Rocky Mountains, he recommended should be preserved because of the great herds of bison, the other wildlife, and all the tribes that relied on those animals for their existence. Well, unfortunately, his recommendation was not acted upon. And one of our greatest ecological wonders was transformed into railroads, agricultural development, uh, cities and towns, and that wonderful place will never again be what it once was. As a result of my 20-some years working as a wildlife biologist in the Arctic Refuge, I, I became to realize that the refuge, which is located right up about here, is the closest thing we now still have to that wonderful system, ecosystem of the Great Plains that once existed. It's the best and last that we have to this day. Next, please. And this realization came to me uh, in the summer of 1983 when I was involved with a census of the porcupine caribou herd. And one evening we were camped on the shores of the Arctic Ocean and there was a huge herd of caribou massed about two miles away to the west. And there were so many animals that you could hear a distant rumbling of these hundreds of thousands of hooves that were churning the tundra and the grunting vocalizations between the cows and their calves, which is normal communications that caribou do at that time. I walked out of the camp, I put my binoculars out to the northwest at the edge of this group of caribou and rotated all the way around 180 degrees from northwest to southeast. It was a solid wall of caribou. And then rising in the distance, was the tall peaks of the Arctic mountains, snow-capped and glistening golden in the light of the midnight sun. It was a transformational moment for me because it harkened back to my boyhood days in Minnesota when I used to imagine what the Great Plains might have been like in this environment where I was growing up. Since that time, I've had a number of experiences while working in the refuge that magically unfolded before me and uh, gave me these transformational feelings. Uh, next, please. And I'm not alone in having these experiences. In the course of my work over the years, I often meet visitors to the refuge who are coming back from their trip at the village airport, and I've seen their glowing faces filled with awe 
and their excited voice explaining to me their astonishing stories of what they experienced when they were out in this great wilderness refuge. Um, our primordial past, the refuge is a place that takes us back in time. It's like going back in time like a time machine to an earlier time when we were closely embedded in a wild natural world. And it, what amazes me is that we still have this ability to reconnect to the natural conditions that we evolved under as human beings. But we need a wild place to do so. And in the Arctic Refuge, we have one of the best places left on this planet to reconnect with our distant past. For here in the refuge, we have a vast, remote Arctic landscape that is still essentially untouched by humans. And it's a place where the natural ecological processes and evolutionary processes have been unhindered by humans to unfold before us since the beginning of time on this planet. It's something incredibly special. Um, for more than 60 years, conservation, uh, more than 60 years ago, conservationists uh, led by Olas and Margaret Murray began a historic campaign to establish the Arctic Refuge. Only their campaign was different than any of the purposes that came before in conservation history uh, that focused on large uh, geographic features of special condition, such as the Grand Canyon or uh, the geysers of Yellowstone. This campaign was different. They sought to set aside a place for its ecological integrity and for its wilderness values. And this was based on Aldo Leopold's ideas that he wrote about. Uh, he talked about the wilderness being our baseline for normalcy. And what that means is that it's the raw material from which our civilization has been forged. And he felt it was important that we retain some of this raw material as a touchstone to our past and that it has great value in helping us understand our relationship in the natural world. They also, uh, next slide please. Uh, uh, could you go to the next, please? The uh, wildlife refuge is uh, loaded with wildlife, as Jeff had mentioned. Uh, we've got uh, healthy populations of wolves, uh, moose, caribou, polar bears, lots of migratory birds that come to the refuge to nest in the summertime and migrate to all 50 states, six continents. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to say one other thing, and that is that, uh, next slide. Uh, another purpose for the refuge was spelled out by, by Mr. Murray, that the place should not be radically changed as a wildlife management experiment, that it should be kept for basic scientific study, for the observation as a help to us for our understanding of the natural processes of the universe. So these people were thinking big, and they were thinking long term uh, in their purposes for the refuge. Next slide. It was Wallace Stegner who first described wilderness as our geography of hope. The refuge stands as a landscape of ecological wisdom where we can learn for how ecosystems work, and from such knowledge, we can forge a more sustainable relationship with the planet that's, that, that supports us. The refuge allows us to see ourselves as part of something much larger. Next slide, please. And Howard Zahnizer, the primary author of the Wilderness Act, also stated 
that to know the wilderness is to know a profound humility, to recognize one's littleness, to sense dependency, interdependence, indebtedness, and responsibility. So that, in a nutshell, is really what wilderness, the idea of wilderness, is all about. Next slide. During a great deal of the last 50 years that the refuge has been established, there has been a continued effort by some to get the United States Congress to open the area to oil development. As a result of this debate, many Americans have now heard about the Arctic Refuge, and many of them have come to its defense in the political debate. The refuge has so far survived these assaults, and it has become a symbol of something even greater than itself. It's now seen as a catalyst that can help us as a turning point to move away from fossil fuels and towards better energy conservation and renewable and clean energy sources. Today, as the price of gas uh, continues to rise, we find that some in our country are again using this as a reason to, uh, to lobby Congress to open the refuge to oil drilling. This tactic has been a pattern over the years, but it's not a realistic solution to our energy situation. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates the situation. The countries on this map have been scaled up relative to the amount of oil reserves that are known to be there. And as you can see, all of North America and Alaska is very tiny in relation to the world's oil supply. And so it's quite ludicrous to believe that if we drill in the Arctic Refuge, it's going to change the world market for oil and drive the price down. It's impossible to do. Uh, we don't have the oil to, to influence the world market and reduce the, uh, the price. Next slide, please. However, this slide shows uh, the estimated amount of oil that might come in, that might be found under the Arctic Refuge in the dark line down below. And the, uh, the big green line is, is uh, the effect that energy conservation and renewable energy can do for us. And the, uh, the left scale going up is in millions of barrels of oil. And you can see the time frame down below. This information comes from the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Agency. In closing, I'd just like to say that as we gather to celebrate the 50th anniversary of establishment of the Arctic Refuge, which we are doing right now, we must still wonder, will it be here again in its untouched condition 50 years from now when we gather to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Arctic Refuge? Or will oil development with its harmful impacts, change it forever, like what happened to the Great Plains? How will global warming change the environment and the wildlife of the refuge? Will its wilderness character still inspire us to work for sustainable existence on this planet? Next slide, please. The future resides with us. Thank you. <laughs>